Hello, everyone. Welcome to Snap Take. This is Glazer of Snap Judgments, the official podcast of Marvel Snap Zone. Two weeks ago, and you should be seeing this in the corner relatively soon, two weeks ago, we did tips to get to infinite fast. These were the beginner's tips of Marvel Snap to get to infinite. Today, we're going to look at 10 advanced tips. Before we get started, though, I want to tell you about the Marvel Snap Judgments League. It is a $1 entry on our Patreon. As long as you give that $1, you get to compete in a pot of 32. The winner of that pod gets a season pass and put into the winner's bracket where they will compete for even bigger prizes with the best of the best. We are um, also have like 30, uh, excuse me, 60 plus major content creators in this tournament. So if you want to compete with Marvel Snap's best, if you want to intermingle with some of the best players, check out the Patreon at patreon.com slash snap judgments. My kitty is sneezing. Bless you, kitty. All right. You should also hit that sub button, hit that like, hit that comment. We bring you brand new Marvel Snap videos six days a week. We are the most thorough home for all of Marvel Snap. So please make sure to check us out. Hit that sub, ring that notification bell. I promise you, you will find value. You will get better at Marvel Snap. You'll find content that no one else is giving you. Our basic outline for today is we are beginning with um, our questions of the day. As we always do them, we've got five tips for infinite. Then we've got a quick intermission. Five more tips for intimate. Last chance. Sorry, for intimate, for infinite, last chance to buy Cull Obsidian, the new card that came out last week. We always do a last chance review on the Monday right before the card goes out of the spotlight uh, caches. And we have a deck guide, which is our general like channel structure where we're going to break down an Ika deck because we love Ika. Ika is a brilliant deck builder who is severely, severely underrated. We'll end with Patreon shout outs. Woo, hello, we are going to be joined by a kitty for this video if you heard that meow. All right, Tommy Tutez. Tommy Two Toes, Tommy Two Toes, Tommy Two Toes asks what Patreon is and why it matters. So a Patreon is a place to support creators directly. Most Patreons are offer extra content for people who really. Ooh, hello, Addy. Uh, I don't know if you can see him, but he's here. He's actually between me and the mic, so I'm gonna pull him over. He's fed, so I don't know what he wants, but here we go. There we go. Good kitty. All right. So Tommy Two Toes. Um, asked about Patreon. And Patreon is a place you can support creators directly. It allows them to do extra cool projects. Most podcasts have a Patreon, and we have a podcast that airs every Saturday on the Marvel Snaps on YouTube and every podcatcher. It's called, you guessed it, Snap Judgments Pod. So what this is allowing us to do in this case is allowing us to put on this tournament. We do more giveaways in Marvel Snap than everyone, so it allows us to do those giveaways. Um, we try and support smaller creators with subs by promoting them. It helps us do that kind of stuff. So all of that is what we're personally using our Patreon for right now. Patrons in general are just a way to say, I like that content, and I think the way that person makes content is great. I'd like to continue to support them. Lots of people have Patreons. Several Marvel Snap creators have Patreons. And we have one. McGregor asks if I've ever competed in a Snap tournament. And no, no, I have not. I'm actually planning on competing in the second Snap Judgments League tournament. I'm not going to compete in the first, largely because I'm going away for a week in the middle of March. Um, we're going to Dominican Republic. I know that's a second vacation. As you're watching this, I'm in Universal Studios. But uh, in Florida, not California. So... I have not had the opportunity yet to compete in a Snap tournament. But for both the Snap Fan Opens... And the, um, excuse me, and the Snap Battle Arena tournaments that Alphos ran for months, I was a regular commentator. I've, in fact, even commented one basically entire Snap Battle Arena from beginning to end in, like, one giant 12-hour session. So I've commented, I've got a lot of experience with calling tournaments, which I will be doing for the Snap Judge League, but I haven't actually competed in one yet. Your USD asks if I like Marvel or DC better and why, and I've, um, fundamentally always liked Marvel better, and honestly, a lot of it's just when I was a little kid, I really loved DC, but DC always felt very far away. I went down to one of my neighbor's houses, I lived in a building in the Bronx, and he had, uh, his name was Jimmy, I don't know why I remember that, but I do, I was maybe five, and I was terrified of Freddy Krueger, and um, he showed me a Wolverine toy, and I thought Wolverine was the coolest thing in the world, and in my dreams, Wolverine protected me from Freddy Krueger as a little five-year-old, and as I got older, I, start, I loved the X-Men more and more. I ended up um, loving the Avengers a ton and the Fantastic Four. I never really fully got into Spider-Man. But while Batman and Superman were my favorites as a kid, when I started reading comics in the 90s, um, bluntly, a lot of the early 90s Superman's comics didn't land with me at all. Um, the Batman comics, it was like Nightfall, and that didn't really work for me. I didn't actually get into Batman comics until like right after No Man's Land, during No Man's Land. Uh, but the X-Men were a hit, right? 
um, a lot of that Iron Man stuff, a lot of that like Fantastic Four stuff was absolutely stellar. So I really, really got into Marvel. Eventually, in my teens, I got into both a fair amount, and I was really, really into DC. Um, a lot of the early, is it Jeff Johns? I think it's Jeff Johns. A lot of the early like JSA stuff and that uh, Flash stuff of that era, and the Morrison Justice League, I thought was absolutely stellar. I ended up liking DC more than Marvel for a little while, and then the new Fifty Two happened, and I ended up like hating. Like they went in a very '90s direction, but I didn't like '90s DC, so they ended up really pushing comics that were not of the type that I super enjoyed. And so I kept reading Marvel and I've mostly fallen off Marvel. What I mostly read now are fantastic four books an occasional book like squirrel girl that's standalone. And I keep up with the X titles since uh, the Hickman run began, but I prefer Marvel because um, it's not that they never like do anything dumb. Sorry. As the cat passes by again, it's not that they never do anything dumb. It's that they're less likely to do something that, um, kicks me off all of their books at once like DC did. All right. So Gunny T says these notes come from Gunny T. Gunny T is Snap Tactics Gunny T over on YouTube, who has a wonderful channel going over a bunch of tips. Really wish this cat would get away from the microphone. Um, so Gunny T says you are not snapping enough. Yes, you, dear viewer, you are not snapping enough. Lambie says these tips are hard and I better do a good job explaining them well. Um, I sent the I sent these to Lambie and was like, hey, Lambie, uh, what do you think of these? He was like, OK, these are all right. They're 100 percent right. But these are going to be a big deal. Like these aren't things that most people do well. These are things that even top players struggle with. Well, I'm going to do my best. And just a reminder, you can find Gunny T at YouTube.com slash Snap Tactics. It's not 6176 anymore. It is now Snap Tactics Gunny T. Also check out Lambie at Lambie Series TV on Twitch and Lambie Series Gaming on YouTube. All right, pro tip number 10, play good decks. That sounds ridiculous, right? Um, but the easiest thing to do if you just want to climb, if all your goal is, is to climb and do well, is to take one of the best decks that fits your play style, that's known, has a thousand games, and just play it well consistently. That's not a lot of what this channel is about, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. But if you want to brew, test off ladder. That's what Conquest is for. You can test brews on Conquest without losing any rank especially if you're trying to hit infinite you're trying to get those big numbers don't test them in higher infinite silver is perfectly fine for testing a brew small sample decks that win 70 ish games will have outlandish win rates those will come to earth but if you have time the day that one of those pops and it usually pops honestly from a video like mine like um like i don't know Prashan, so on oh my god this cat is driving me crazy <laughs> sorry he really 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 wants to move all around okay so small sample decks will come back down to earth, but you can take early advantage with a huge cube rate and win rate from them when others don't know what they're doing. However, large, large sample high winning cube rate is the way to go. Cube rate is, remember, a function of players, not necessarily just a function of deck, though. Okay. Pro tip number nine. Many good players fail to climb due to a lack of snap aggression. I have a player that I know who has a almost... um. 60 plus percent win rate who has struggled climbing because of lack of slap, uh, snap aggression. There are many players I know like this. I see them in my comments all the time. They're like, I win with this deck a ton and I can't. And then there's players that play good decks and they're like, I can't win with this at all. Well, spoiler, you got to learn the deck first in Conquest. Don't pick up a deck and assume you're auto going to win. A three game sample is not real. You're going to climb very slowly, winning one and two cubes at a time. Whether you're pre or post infinite, you're not going to rank up quickly. If you're just trying to win off an opponent's snaps, the opponent is essentially using the rest of this list, the rest of these tips on you. Don't be taken advantage of. You're being taken advantage of by fundamentally what amounts to card game sharking. So instead of that, let's use these tips to our best advantage. All right, your goal is to make your opponent play into your good hands. You have a hand. If you need to, when you build the deck, say, what do I want to see for this deck to work? Make a list. If you see one of those hands that has like three of the um, four, three of the five cards you want on turn two, three, snap. Your job is to make them pay to see and draw into answers. Make them pay and see and draw into their best hands. Got it? If it helps, again, write down the hands and locations you can use for this. We're going to start that on the channel when time permits, going through like the best hands and locations for decks so that you know them as snap conditions time permitting we're trying to set up a major tournament and we still do a video a day so within the next couple months that's going to be our next major plan 
to give you those early hints. But hey, we give you a turn by turn. If we're giving you a turn by turn and there's key cards in that turn by turn, go, okay, which of these do I need to see? Which of these are key to the game plan and which help me win? This is fundamentally a poker tactic. In, a po in poker, when you get, I don't know, I don't have the right terminology, but when you get a good hand, your job is to um, bid high early and the opponent is supposed to supposed to generally get out they're not waiting and risking more to see if they draw the right thing later their job is to get out when they see you have the high thing when you are representing by bidding more that you have the powerful thing all right play a deck enough to understand your snap conditions every deck snaps differently Lambie became famous at some point for saying, if you're playing Thanos, you snap on Mindstone because Mindstone gives you such a ridiculous advantage because it was at the time very likely to draw you into a um, extra draw stone. Now it's less likely because only half the stone was draw. Zabu decks were very famous because they would almost always snap on um, Zabu because if they had Zabu, they were so far ahead. If your opponent didn't have what they were looking for and you had Zabu, you were extremely likely to win. Lockjaw decks snap on Lockjaw. Black Knight decks, if you have Black Knight and any discard card, snap. Generally speaking, if you have three combo pieces, if you have already Wong um, and Odin, right? You're probably safe to snap, assuming you're running White Tiger and Doom. If you're only running one, um, and you have ramp, obviously, for the Doom part. If you're only running one of those, then now you want to wait a little bit to see what you draw, to see if you're finding a combo that lets you go for it. Snap conditions aren't big plays. They're the setup to the big plays. Note that Lockjaw itself isn't, I flipped into Infinite. Um, Zabu itself isn't, I saw all the other cards that go with Zabu. You have the setup, you have the preparation for what your deck needs to really click. Number six. <clears throat> when you snap early from turns two to four, sometimes they will answer. Let's say they drop a Killmonger under Black Knight, or Rogue your Zabu, or whatever. First, it feels more that, like this happens than it actually does. It's always going to feel like your opponent has your hard counter. Our brain is primed to remember shocking events, not consistent events. So when that shocking negative event happens, or it's a shock to our system and it registers as this happens all the time, and your brain immediately remembers the last time it faced that, and this is clearly like stronger, the last time it faced that pain or trauma or it wound. So it's going to connect those two relationships. It happens more than you, th it happens much less than you think it does, but it feels like it happens a lot. That's fine. Please don't be discouraged. Your brain is going to tell you that it's your job to keep that under control and go, no, this is a thing that happens. Unless, like, let's say you're playing um, Black Knight and you're playing in a meta that's, like, all destroy. There was a point a month ago that it was all destroy. Well, then maybe you need to switch decks, right? Like, if the meta is specifically built right now to counter your deck, usually even a very highly played deck is not more than about 10% of the meta, so you shouldn't be seeing it more than once every 10 games. But, hey, maybe you're in a pocket where that's really common. Feel free to switch up to catch your breath, but you should always go back. Generally speaking, we're hedging our bets on good hands. We're assuming that our good hands are going to pay dividends, but they're not always. We're saying we are more likely to win, so we're leaning into those good hands. That doesn't mean we can't run when they blow up. Now, if they Killmonger that Black Knight or Rogue that Zabu, should you run immediately? No. Did they snap back? If they snap back, you can go, right? If they snap back after the play, then they've made a huge mistake. But if they snap back and you stayed in, then you stay until the last turn because your deck can still do a thing that can still win that game, right? This isn't your only condition. This isn't the only thing your deck can do. So since your deck can still pull off the victory in those situations, if you have already stayed on the snap back because they snapped and killmongered, then you can um, stay in until the last turn. If they didn't snap and they played it and they got your Black Knight before you got any value out of it, they stopped your Zabu before you got much value out of it, then at that point, stay in unless they snap. Got it? You're staying in there. It, the stakes are already raised. Unless they are further raising it, there's no reason to run. You are already in for that amount. See if you can pull out that win until the last turn or until they snap. At that point, the stakes will double, right? And if you don't see what you need, then you can be running. Number five, do not, not, not wait until you're in dominant position to snap. You should lose after you snap a fair bit. I'll be on people's streams all the time. 
and just I chat with a lot of um, genuinely very good players while they stream. And I'm thinking of someone in particular, and I definitely don't want to say who. But I'll be like, you should snap here. And they'll go, but they could have this or that to answer me. They could beat me this way. Yes, that is true. You could lose after you snap. You should lose after you snap a fair bit. But if your win rate remains high enough, and I'm talking like a mid to high 50s for something, I'm not talking about anything crazy, then you would rather have those wins count for more and those losses count for more. Remember that those high wins are generally getting in you four cubes. Well, even if you snap, if you lose and they answer you, you're only losing two cubes. That's still climbing at double the speed. If your opponent snaps you, you can snap back if you know what they have and are doing. One, do math. I lost a game earlier today because, literally, earlier today, because I thought I was up by one in the lane. I didn't count it. I eyeballed it, and I had an extra card. I had a Nico that was just an extra one at the end of the game, and I put it in a different lane, seeing if I could do a little bit of fortification other lane because I didn't count. The other lane was completely full. I just didn't do the math. And it was completely on me. If I had done the math, I would have known what would have won, and I would have won. Now, you often know what an opponent has, and you have a reasonably good idea of where they're going to play it. Certain decks are running Doom. Certain decks are running Goliath. Certain decks are running, um, I don't know, Shang-Chi, right? Look at the deck. Know the deck. If you do, then you can snap back when they snap you. You've got your combo. And if you know your combo counters their combo, that's the perfect chance to snap back. Smart players should run. Most players will not because of ego. If you snap after dominance and they run, you lost a cube. Same as if you retreated on turn one of your next game. So let's say you play your um, Zabu and then the next turn you go Rock Slide. And then the turn after that you go, um, what's it called? Um, Ravona into... Watch him call it on rock slide. Why is the name of this card escaping me? Oh, uh, Grandmaster. And now you've got four rocks in their deck. You um, and you've got two cost reducers, and then you snap. Unless your opponent has something completely crazy, they should run, right? All you did was force them to run early. And like, if you don't see other cards, like if you've got like subterranean and you drew a couple of rocks, and if that's the point where you snap and you're just trying to chase them off, that's fine. But generally speaking, if you snap before that Zabu, they stayed in and then they just got their hand screwed up, and now you doubled your cubes. Good? Even if they retreat on that two instead of that one. Now, what happens if you don't snap? They're still going to end up retreating, right? Or you snap late. They're still going to end up retreating. But now you only got one cube. That is the exact same thing as going into your next game and having them drop um, a forge Deadpool and snap you and then you have to retreat. You just gave up that extra game. Right? You lost that ex you lost an extra game because you didn't take advantage of your snap conditions early. And that's why you need to snap early. All right, intermission time. So how to implement? First, start with the previous video, video titled 10 Must Know Snap Tips. Cool. We're going to work on those first. These are more advanced tips. So you start with the last tips, and then you go to this one. Then you write down one tip. I prefer you do it in a notebook, but if you need to do it digitally, that's fine. Write down one tip that you want to work on. Practice it over and over in Conquest. And I suggest Conquest Silver. It's relatively easy to get silver tickets. Just go and do the double snap in, um, whatchamacallit mode? Brain. In Proving Grounds. Go over and snap right away in Proving Grounds. As long as you snap right away in Proving Grounds, um, you'll get, like, if you take, I don't know, 20 minutes, half hour, you'll get a whole bunch of silver tickets, and then you go practice these over and over in the Conquest until that one tip is internalized. Then you write down the next tip, and you do it again. Now you're practicing two tips at once. Got it? If you do that with this whole list, with that other whole list, I promise you will be a significantly better snap player. Is that necessarily fun? Eh. Depends how what your goal for fun is. If your real goal is, I think it's fun, I think my brain gets endorphins and I feel better when I hit the top 1,000, if you do this, you can hit the top 1,000. Got it? Good. On to pro tip four. Understand the meta and how your tech pieces fit the game. Snap before you think your tech will beat them. For example, um... Uh, Mobius, Michael M uh, Mobius and Mobius, I don't know why Michael and Mobius, Mobius and Mobius beat Sarah, but is useless versus Thanos. So if you know you're playing Thanos, if you have another play on three, playing MMM is usually useless. 
But against Sarah, you want to get that down as soon as possible, especially if you think they might have Zabu, but not too soon, because it's also worth knowing that they run Enchantress, and if they just Enchantress that on four, then you're a little sad. Enchantress wrecks Living Tribunal decks, but dies to Hell Lockjaw. It does nothing to Hell Lockjaw. So if you're playing Hell Lockjaw on turn four, and four or five is the best stats you can get, then please feel free to play Enchantress. It's go not going to be useful at the end of the game versus Hella. But against Tribunal, you hold that to the end, and it wins you the game, and it wins your extra cubes. Shang-Chi is great against Hella, excuse me, but mid versus Sarah. Most Sarah decks don't really try to get stats that are that high. Occasionally, they'll be running a call now, but otherwise, they're really topping out at cards like Gladiator, which are eight. So that Shang is not going to be good. Same thing, Shang, uh, Shadow King dominated the Loki Bounce Meta, but it lacks a real home now. There's not a deck that consistently is building up power in that way. Even Bounce puts that power out late, so Shadow King is a much, much, much worse card. It's all but disappeared from the meta. Know what your tech is, um, and know what... It, tech is good into what matchups if you have the right tech for the right matchup snap before you play it if you know you can um play mmm on turn four against sarah then you snap before that however snapping for that card on thanos is going to be useless you need to know your opponent's deck and be able to play what tech is good against it all right tip three understand your opponent's deck that seems important for the previous one, right? You need to know what your opponent's deck is. There are tons of tier lists you can use to study. Cam Best puts one out every week. Cozy puts one out every week. Um, who else? I think Alex Cochia does a top 10 decks of the week. Like a bunch of content creators. Hooglin does one every week. Uh, our friend Combat Snap does one every week. Marvel Snap Zone has a tier list every week. It's purely data-based. Um, I think Untapped has one that I like, honestly like less because... They categorize stuff weird. I think theirs is fully automated while SnapZone has Den curating and Den adds like context to it. So I like to use the Marvel SnapZone tier list to study. Largely, and the difference between it, I think Cam's is the next best, even though his is purely opinion based, um, just because Cam understands the meta so well. I like to use the Marvel SnapZone one because it's written down and then I don't have to refer back to stuff. I can just refer back to a website instead of trying to go back and forth in a video. So, Use it to understand your opponent's deck. Study that tier list. How you study it is up to you. Um, my personal tip for doing so, and I've said this previously, is when you're playing a game, keep a notepad next to you or a notepad app, and after like turn two or three, try and predict what your opponent's deck is. Say, this deck is this from this tier list, or a version of this from the tier list. And you'll see a fair amount of, like, two out of every ten games, you'll see something that's relatively new and off-meta, that's fine. But 90% of the time, um, or 80% of the time, the deck is going to be something that you'll get from the tier list. See how quickly you can guess it? Make it a game with yourself, you'll get there more quickly than you think. Your job is to snap when they are floundering. So if you know you're playing a Rock Slide Darkhawk deck, let's say um, they play a Korg, then they miss Zabu and they miss Rock Slide. You can snap relatively safely. You should be snapping. They are missing turns. They are missing what they are doing. Good? If they go um, Korg, Jeff, I don't know, Cosmo, right? Korg, Jeff, um, middling card, or Korg, Jeff, pass, snap, please. They are missing stuff. If you see Thanos and it's like turn two or three, you can check their deck size, remember. If you see Thanos and it's turn like two and you see no draw stones, snap, snap, snap. They are falling behind. All they have is big stuff that you should be able to go over and around. Know what your opponent is doing. Know the meta like the turn before. And if they're missing their turns, one of the ways you win is you snap on their weak hands. If I am playing a Zabu deck, and I don't see Zabu and my opponent snaps me, it is time to go. You should be doing the same thing to that opponent. So tip two, don't immediately snap or snap back. Always wait 10 to 20 seconds to snap. In fact, it's better to wait for the rope. It's called roping when you wait for the end of the timer to snap. Um, if you have the patience for that, it is generally good practice. If you want to be the very top player, it is almost always good to wait till the end. I personally am fine waiting 10 to 20 seconds to snap, unless I just want to scare my opponent off, right? Um, one The easiest location to do this on is Lamentis. Sometimes you see Lamentis and you know they're playing Thanos. I always snap against opponent Thanos on Lamentis because they probably got some stones that don't do a whole lot right now. They may have Blob, which is literally a dead card right now. 
So your opponent's going to think you're looking for a solution to a problem that you've already solved if you wait 10 to 20 seconds to snap. In fact, while I'm waiting 10 to 20 seconds to snap because I'm waiting, my opponent often thinks I don't know what I'm doing and snaps at me. They assume you're debating whether you should stay or leave. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to do it. And they snap you. Meanwhile, you've already decided you're going to snap and are just waiting. It's the best way to get snaps back and the best way to get huge, huge stop, snap equity. Finally, last one, be confident. Be ready to lose two cubes. Be ready to lose two cubes, whether it be from your snap or your opponent's snap. Losing two cubes is my standard amount of losing. I lose one cube once in a while, but I am aggressive. I'm probably too aggressive. But be ready to lose two cubes. Be ready to snap and still have to run. If they snap and you don't have it, lose, run at one. You just saved yourself an extra cube from your win later. Almost every game I play has a snap in it. At least over 75% of my games have a snap in them, whether from me or the opponent. If my opponent snaps, probably 60% of the time, I'm leaving. If I'm not snapping, I'm likely retreating. If they're snapping, I don't always raise them. Got it? Just because they snapped and I feel confident does not mean I raise them. Sometimes I'm willing to see to um, because I feel like we're both in strong positions, and at that point, we're just letting it play out. I want to play into my snaps. I'm not afraid to play into my opponent's snaps if I think I have an answer. But um, if both of us are seeing what we what's good, then I don't need to raise the stakes further. I'm happy letting the stakes be raised naturally by them and letting my decisions play out later. Now, if they play more and I realize I'm not afraid to snap back later, always after the 10 to 20 seconds. But almost every game you play in Marvel Snap should have a snap in it at some point. All right, those are our tips. Hopefully you find them useful. Hopefully you try them out. Let me know in the comments how they work for you as you learn them. And now we have Ika Draw. This is our friend Ika's Lockjaw deck. This is, in my personal opinion, the best home for Howard the Duck in Marvel Snap, potentially ever. This deck maintains a stupidly high win rate right now, right here in Marvel Snap. Um, I don't know if I pulled the stats before or after I did this because I made this lecture a couple days ago, but this is a very, very strong deck. It is a nice, simple way to learn how to do most of these strategies because Lockjaw is extremely powerful, but it's also high variant, so sometimes you're going to snap on Lockjaw and not get amazing stuff. Now, your trick is Howard into Lockjaw makes your snaps more threatening. If you go Howard into Lockjaw, you can wait a turn to snap, and then if you snap after you've waited 10 seconds and looked at the top of your deck, you should be able to scare them off reasonably well. They should be assuming you have XYZ that is really strong, that you have your combo pieces, right? It also makes sure that you don't accidentally jubilee into nothing or play like an Iron Lad into nothing. That's generally bad, right? You'd rather play Thor or Beta Ray, but if your Jubilee is going to grab a Doom, then all of a sudden maybe you wait on that Beta Ray build, right? You see what I mean? That kind of decision is really important, and Howard lets you make it intelligently. It tells you which play is better. And with um, Lockjaw, Jubilee, and Lad all in the deck, well, that's backbreaking. All right. Howard can be Echo, Jeff, or Nightcrawl. You don't lose too much for any of those. Um... Howard could, in fact, even be one more big card. This deck needs Beta Ray Bill and Lad. In fact, I'm less sure it needs Lad now a few days later. I think Iron Lad could be an extra um, good-sized uh, six-cost card. I think if you really wanted to, Iron Lad could be anything like Infinite or anything like uh, Magneto or Giganto without losing too much in this deck. This needs um, Beta Ray Bill, though. Beta Ray Bill is still super important. You can find Ika on twitch.tv slash Ika, uh, sorry, underscore Ika MTS. Ika is a brilliant, brilliant player. Okay, so turn one, Howard. Turn two, Quack, Howard again. Turn three, Lockjaw versus Thorin. Let's talk about this. If you have Lockjaw plus, um, plus, let's say you don't have Howard, obviously. If you have Lockjaw, ooh, I guess we should talk with him without Howard too there. If you have Lockjaw and Wasp, you almost always want a Lockjaw and Wasp, unless you've looked at the top card of your deck, and Lockjaw Wasp is getting you nothing interesting. At that point, you might as well drop Thor. Good. You can always Lockjaw Wasp the next turn. Now, if you have Lockjaw without Wasp, I'll usually play Thor first, because Thor gives me an extra chance next turn of drawing Mjolnir, which Lockjaw Mjolnir would give me a really good play. I will also in turn four go Lockjaw Howard over just playing Howard separately. 
Same thing is basically true of Beta Ray Bill. On turn four, I'm playing Lockjaw, but I will play Beta Ray Bill and Thor first if I already have Jane in hand. Jane changes my calculus unless I have a zero that I can get rid of with Lockjaw. That extra zero changes my Lockjaw math. There's also um, Thor against Jubilee against Lad. I almost always want to play Thor first. Again, barring Howard, right? If Howard is in hand, I'm far more likely to play Jubilee or Iron Lad. I don't really, really want to hit Howard with those cards. I will always Thor if I have... Whoop, kitty's back. Hello. I will always Thor if I have Jane. Like, always Thor if I have Jane. But that's not always, like, straight up obvious, right? I also want to try and throw priority where possible. Not always the easiest when I'm playing a 4, a... Oop, a four, a six, and an eight. But if I can throw priority, I will, because I don't want to open up my Thors to um to later plays of Shang-Chi. Okay, turn five. Jane, if any Thor is out, or I have or I need a wasp for Lockjaw for the last turn. If not, I will play White Tiger into Jaw or just drop Iron Man. Turn six is Doom or Odin. If I got a Doom out, I'm much more likely to throw Odin. And if I have hammers, I can hammers and Odin on the hammers for a bunch of extra power. All good? That's how I play this deck. If you play this deck and practice it with these tips in mind, you will do well. As always, you do a quick hip count when we do this. We've got Wasp, Howard. I've got like four Howards for no reason. Lockjaw, Jubilee, Iron Lad, Iron Man. And Odin, a seven hipper, not bad. We also, this is my current favorite Jane. I'll get the hip when it's out. This is my current favorite Doom. I have it with the gold background. I need a beta ray. Love Throg. And White Tiger is the last card not released in 2024 that I need a variant for that I don't have one for. Only one White Tiger variant, and it refuses to show up in my shop. All right, last chance review for Call Obsidian. Series five, 6,000 tokens. I think Call is a must buy card. I think Call is one of the. Uh, Cards in Marvel Snap that goes in the most decks. People have been asking about Call against Blob. Blob is a more powerful card, but Blob has one quarter of the homes. Blob's got two real homes. Gunny's Big Dumb Idiot's deck. Please see Friday's video. And Thanos Lockjaw. Please see last Monday's video. Outside of that, Blob does not have a real home. Call goes in everything from Bounce to, um, to Annihilus to Darkhawk. Call is a featured card almost everywhere. The way Cull plays, the way Cull fits into a lot of decks, reminds me a lot of the way Iron Lad is in a lot of decks, and that's the card, kind of card you just want to get. What card would I get over Cull? The real debate is, do I want Cull more than I want Gladiator, who's in next week's caches? I think it depends if you need two cards. I want Cull more than Gladiator. I don't want Cull more than Gladiator and Corphus. So if you need either Thanos or... um other card this week, or Nimrod, I'd rather have Cull and even those cards, well, even Nimrod, than Gladiator and um, Corvus. However, if you need Gladiator, Corvus, and X-23, just wait till next week. Good. X-23 has too many uses. Now we've hit over. But over any one card next week, I'd rather have Cull Obsidian. I think he's going to be in an absolute ton of decks forever. I think he is a key piece in Marvel Snap. This is the real deal, as far as I can tell. All right, certain tiers of support on our Patreon come with on-air thanks. We've got Abigail Giesler, Mandatory Burnout, Cables, DG Winfield, Direwolf, LAB, Father Newman, Good Dog Gamer, Inc., Jay Neveri, JD McDonaldino, Akela Platano, Kirtix Lee, Koire, Jay Bussy, Models, Louis Antunes, Matt Conduit, Matt H., Mikey Hijinks, No Flex, Ocularis, Pretty Chill, Seamus, Spike Jones, Two Ties, Tucker, X-Force V, The Homie Min, and of course, Gunny T. Thank you all so much for your support. The cat has finally wandered away. All right, hopefully you enjoy these tips. Hopefully you find them useful. These are like top tier tips for great players in Marvel Snap. I promise you, try them out. You will get better as you internalize them. Remember that learning is not some doing something once. Learning is internalization and learning to do something consistently. Hit that sub, hit that like, hit that comment. I think you're really going to find value in the channel. In fact, I know you will. Check out the Patreon if you're willing, and don't forget that the tournament exists over on that Patreon. We'll see you uh, tomorrow with another Snap Take, where we're going to break down Corvus and have an absolute ridiculous amount of decks for Corvus Glaive, Gladiator, and X-23. Peace.